So in this video, I'm going to talk about common analytic activities involved in qualitative and mixed methods research, regardless of the data that you're working with or the methodological approach you're taking to the analysis. The first thing to say is that qualitative and mixed methods research are varied and flexible fields, and we work with a variety of data collection methods and data analysis methods. In terms of data, we may be working with primary data, collecting interviews, focus groups, observations, field notes, questionnaires with open-ended questions. There's a whole range of different ways that we can collect primary data. And there's also a range of naturally occurring or secondary data that we may be working with, policy documents, newspaper articles, or social media and other web-based content. Then we have to think about the analysis methods that we take. And again, there's a whole range of different approaches or methods, grounded theory, IPA, thematic analysis, discourse, narrative, framework analysis, and also content analysis, which takes a more quantitative approach to looking at and interrogating qualitative materials. But across this variety, there are five high level analytic activities that we all engage in. First of all, integrate, meaning bringing things together, combining parts into a whole. Secondly, organize, which is all about splitting things up according to what's different about them or creating structures relating to our objectives. Thirdly, explore which is all about looking at what's actually there in the data, examining the inherent nature of what we have before us. Then we have reflect, and this is central to our analytic work, noticing interesting and meaningful things, considering them carefully and deeply and capturing those thoughts. And finally, interrogate, which is all about asking questions of the data and what we've done with our materials previously, following up our earlier work. So let's break each of those down a little bit more. So first of all, integrate or bringing things together, combining parts into a whole. And there are three aspects to think about in this regard. Firstly, the materials that we're working with. And I'm using the term materials rather than data here, because as well as the data, the primary or secondary data that we may be working with, there will be often all kinds of supplementary or background materials that we need to bring together uh, throughout our project. So we need to think about the types of materials that we're working with and their role in our project. Why are we working with them? How are they useful? And what's their relationship in our project as a whole? Secondly, we need to think about the analyses. Are we taking a purely qualitative approach to analyzing our qualitative materials or are we quantifying in some way? Or indeed, we may be mixing elements of different uh, analytic approaches throughout the different stages of our work. Finally, if we're working in teams, as many of us do, we need to think about integrating the contributions of multiple team members. How do we go about splitting and combining our work? How do we assess consistency? Is that something that we need to do? And how does that look in a project? In fact, consistency is relevant, even if you're working as an individual, but the consistency then is something a little bit different, not consistency between different analysts or team members, but consistency throughout an analysis. So thinking about all of these things that we need to bring together to integrate is partly related to our research design and is really important in informing how we actually go about the analysis. Secondly, organizing, splitting things up according to what's different about them and creating structures in that regard relating to our objectives. And there are two key things to think about here. First of all, the facts. So that might be socio-demographic characteristics of the participants who are contributing to our projects, or if we're working with naturally occurring materials, it might be metadata information about journal articles, if we're doing a literature review, or other documents uh, or materials that we're working with. The facts about our data and those who are contributing those materials to our work is really, really important to capture. Secondly, we need to think about organizing the ideas that form the basis of our analysis. And there are three th key things to think about here, transcription, conceptualization, and associations. Many of us think that transcription is a lengthy, boring, time-consuming process, but it's actually an analytic act because 
the choices that we make about what to transcribe and how those transcripts look have huge implications on what we can do with our data in analytic terms. So thinking that through uh, is really important. Conceptualization is all about how we capture and think about what's interesting and meaningful in our materials. Many of us in qualitative and mixed methods projects conceptualize that meaning through a process of coding. We may be coding inductively bottom up or more deductively top down or indeed a combination of those uh, broad approaches. But coding is not the only way that we conceptualize what's interesting and meaningful in our data. We also need to think about the associations between concepts, themes, categories, and between and within the data themselves. So organizing the ideas that form the basis of our analysis is a separate way of thinking about our materials from the factual characteristics, and both are important in qualitative and mixed methods projects. Thirdly, exploring. So thinking about what's actually there in the data in examining the inherent nature of what we have before us. When we code, we're making an interpretation. We're deciding what chunk of data is meaningful and how it's meaningful. And we capture that through the labels and the definitions that we use for our codes. But sometimes it's just as important to think about what's actually there. And that's usefully thought about in terms of content, but also structure. First of all, in terms of content, if we're doing a content analysis, then that's really where the analysis is happening. That's the level at which we're doing our analysis. But even if we're taking much more qualitative approaches to our materials, the surface level can be a really interesting uh, aspect to consider, particularly if we're interested in language, how our participants are expressing themselves as well as what they're saying. And if we're working with secondary materials, then looking at the content can be a really important and useful way to gain a familiarity uh, with the body of materials we have before us. Because we haven't collected them ourselves, we haven't transcribed them, so we may not have that familiarity, especially if we're working with large materials. So content can be really important and interesting to consider, even if you're right on that deeply qualitative end of the qualitative research spectrum. And also we should think about structure. Now, qualitative materials are often talked about as being unstructured, but there are many inherent structures within qualitative materials that we gather. And we may need to access and mark those inherent structures. So just taking interviews as an example, a common form of interviewing is semi-structured interviews, whereby we don't ask everybody exactly the same questions in exactly the same way or the exactly the same order. That would be a structured interview. But in a semi-structured interview, we let the flow of the conversation uh, happen more organically. Uh, but we probably are talking to each participant around several, four or five or however many key topics. If we put thought into what those topic areas are that we need to talk uh, with our participants about, then those topic areas are analytically important structures. So think about the inherent structures in your materials uh, and how and uh, whether they need to be accessed so that you can incorporate them in an analysis. Then we have the analytic activity of reflecting. And this is something that in qualitative and mixed methods projects, we all do all of the time. And so these, this is really about how we capture those reflections. How do we get the interesting and meaningful things that we notice when we work with our materials out of our head so that we can remember them, build on them, incorporate them as we go through the process. And there are two key ways that we can do that. First of all, by writing, and we need to be writing about everything all of the time, the data themselves, the processes that we're employing uh, as part of our analysis, the interpretations that we're generating, and the results or findings uh, later on in the process. But writing's not the only way that we can capture the reflections that we have. We can also capture them by mapping. So thinking about drawing diagrams maybe uh, that reflect or capture the connections between and within our data and the concepts that we're working with. Finally, interrogation. And this is all about asking questions of our data and what we've thought about it or done with it previously. So following up our earlier work. And there are three key things to think about here as well. 
First of all, we're all in the business of identifying patterns and relationships on some level. What those patterns might look like or what those relationships, how they might manifest themselves are going to vary depending on the types of data that we're working with and the approach that we're taking to our analysis. But on some level, patterns and relationships are core to all qualitative and mixed methods projects. But we're also, as qualitative researchers, often just as or even more interested in the anomalies, what's not happening or what few participants are, are uh, experiencing uh, or describing. Sometimes that's really where the analytically interesting uh, things can be found rather than, uh, you know, focusing on uh, the common experience or view. So thinking through what we expect to find in terms of patterns and relationships or how we're going to explore uh, those different patterns and relationships is all related to our research objectives and our questions, of course. Some of us will be working top down. We may be in the business of testing theories or hypotheses, and that's perfectly uh, acceptable in qualitative and mixed methods projects. Uh, but we may also be wanting to uh, interrogate our data to validate our interpretations, to uh, illustrate to those who read our outputs that we haven't just made it all up, that we actually have uh, materials, our, our interpretations, our accounts are grounded uh, in the data. So thinking about those two ways of thinking uh, is really important. And thirdly, I would argue that we all have a comparative element in our projects. Some projects are set up explicitly comparatively. You're, you're explicitly wanting to compare one set of um, uh, experiences or group of participants with another. But even if that's not the case, even if you're working with a more homogenous group or doing a case study uh, project, there will always be lines of comparisons uh, through an analysis in terms of subsets of not just data, but concepts and the cases uh, that we're working with. And a case, the term case in qualitative and mixed methods research means different things depending on our methodological context. Uh, but thinking that through uh, and setting up uh, procedures for accessing or interrogating those are really important. So in summary, uh, the analytic activities are all happening at the strategies level in terms of how we plan our analysis. Now in qualitative and mixed methods uh, projects, we normally can't plan the whole analysis out in one fell swoop because what we're doing is iterative, it's emergent. But these different analytic activities, I would argue, are common across the whole variety of uh, methods and data that qualitative and mixed methods researchers work with. It's just that we operationalize them in different ways, depending on the characteristics of our projects. But I do believe that they're relevant for all of us. Now, I've introduced them to you very briefly in this video uh, as if they're kind of discrete, separate things in a nice bullet pointed list. But of course, we all know that qualitative and mixed methods research is much more messy than that usually. So in reality, it looks a little bit like this. And actually, this is a kind of two dimensional representation of what's actually a four dimensional uh, uh, process. So the first thing to say about this uh, diagram is that it's not a flowchart, right? So there's no kind of start here, then do this. If you're doing grounded theory, do this next. If you're doing discourse analysis, do something else next. There's no flowchart, there's no recipe, there's no step-by-step -step, um, process that we all follow. Uh, and all of these elements in this diagram could actually be connected to one another. Can't do that on a, on a PowerPoint slide uh, because it just looks a, a complete mess. Uh, but we've also got the dimension of time. So we engage in these different activities differently for different purposes and in different ways as we go through that iterative and emergent process uh, of our research. So the point really here is that thinking about these analytic activities, planning for them, but being open to the idea that our plans change, uh, we go down different routes, different things happen in our projects. Um, but nevertheless, uh, thinking about analytic activities as one kind of framework for understanding what is common amongst the variety in qualitative and mixed methods analysis is something that I find useful uh, and that hopefully uh, is interesting and useful to you too. 
So I've done this in a, very briefly today. Uh, if you want to find out more then um, uh, the book uh, on the left hand side there, the colourful book uh, with Anne Lewins, she and I um, have talked about analytic activities uh, in both our previous uh, books actually and myself and Nick Wolf uh, in our five level QDA method books also draw on the idea of analytic activities as one way of uh, thinking about operationalizing your analytic tasks uh, in software. So hopefully that's interesting uh, and useful to you and you have places to go to find out more. <laughs>